As Raccoon City continued to be further ransacked by the infected horde that was piling up everywhere, Umbrella thought this was virtually the best time to turn the entire city into a monster mash, which resulted in a graveyard smash for those for the non-infected. Bussing in not only B.O.W.s from Umbrella into the city, such as the Tyrants and Nemesis, which would go on to stalk the resisting police force and stars, they would also begin to pump in seemingly failed experiments such as the Hunter Gammas, but in particular, Umbrella Europe would bring in a much more successful version known as the Hunter Beta. This reptilian creature would stalk the General Hospital as a hunting ground to prove its usefulness in combat. Running down infected and tearing them apart, it wouldn't be too much longer before both Jill and Carlos would cross paths with these creatures, which threaten to completely sever their carotid arteries from the brain. So in today's episode, we will discuss where these things come from, as well as their genetic makeup that allowed them to be better than the alphas, but at a cost. So first things first, as usual, it always starts with an idea of, yes, we could have separate classes of animals, but combining reptiles with mammals seems much more appropriate. You scientists were so concerned with whether you could, you didn't stop to think if you should, which I've also been guilty of that, so we'll call it scientific curiosity. We know the failed product already known as the Hunter Gamma that were too weak to be used effectively, and if you would like to see a video on that, there will be a link at the end. But initially, all these groups of creatures started out as Hunter Alphas. The initial Hunter Alphas were created by injecting reptilian DNA into a human embryo and then administering a shot of T-virus to serve as a bonding agent. The virus would seemingly help to integrate the genetic material from the reptiles into the genetic coding of the primate. Now, usually, this would result in non-viable young. This is why, for instance, you can't get frisky with an ostrich and then have children. However, Again, with the addition of the T-virus, we have seen massive genetic changes to animals injected, so this is really no different. However, it did still have major flaws as a result. The splicing of human and reptile DNA is not a perfect match. Cells will not divide correctly, ionic gradients cannot keep up amongst neural tissue, and bodies would be more prone to damage. So really just overall, the body would have a more difficult time with just sort of day-to-day -day functions. With the Hunter Alpha, these issues can be seen in a few different ways. First, it is noted that tumors would arise in some some capacity on the body, which could lead to more issues down the line as organs and tissues were necrotized due to pressure. Another issue that seemed to arise is the blending of reptile intellect and human intellect, and this would mean that the creatures were melded, at least in brain capacity. So the intelligence of these creatures was really more like that of an orangutan than of a human. Smarter than a reptile, but less capable than a human. But this did allow them to be taught simple commands, however, and one leftover trait in particular, which specifically is the socialization aspect, remained. This socialization left over from humans meant that they hunted in packs, and this would persist through the other iterations of the creatures formed. With the cost and benefits continuing for the initial prototypes, another cost that would begin to appear was slower reaction time. Due to neural issues most likely affecting the reflex arc within the spine, being hit with a projectile would result in slower reaction time, and that would be considered normal for them, like just like a baseline. However, a benefit of this presumed neural impairment amongst nervous tissue was that the Hunter Alpha was capable of delivering absolutely lethal hits to prey and surviving humans with just a few swipes, which could even negate armor being worn by humans. With this predecessor seeing some success over the mutated animals that were more heavily looked at, it appeared that splicing humans into the equation with animals was much better as a path moving forward and allowed for more intelligent BOWs, even though they were only as smart as an orangutan, which raised the interest of the higher-ups at Umbrella. Another benefit that would ultimately lead to the Hunter Betas was also that these creatures didn't have to be made new each time. They could be cloned and experimented experimented on with more T-virus and different variants and strains, which resulted in cheap, easy-to-produce BOWs and finally, the Hunter Betas. Whereas the Hunter Alpha was developed by Umbrella USA, the Hunter Beta was developed by Umbrella Europe, likely receiving one of the various clones they set out to improve upon Birkin's research. Seeing as the Hunter Alpha was more of just a raw power and lacked agility and reflexes, they set out to refine the nervous tissue of this creature through genetic tampering. In some respects, they were successful and ultimately would improve improve the nervous system of this creature. With the new and improved nervous system, it would be able to sidestep shots that would hit it rather than just getting, you know, shot straight to the face. However, with this improved nervous system, they were still very much vulnerable to sustained fire and could be taken out by conventional means. For the average person, however, like your doctors and nurses in the hospital, these things were incredibly lethal and the doctors and nurses would rarely put up a fight, if any at all. For trained personnel, the hunters were far from invincible. Lacking a major component that their predecessors had, they were not nearly as powerful Powerful. Through the nervous system tampering seen through all Hunter Betas, this would render them weaker, but quicker. In an attempt to overcome this issue, a genetic mutation was added to make the left forearm in particular larger as well as the claws there. But before we talk about that though, let's cover their morphology and see what makes these creatures
characters send you into panic mode when they get close and basically burn through all of your grenades and ammo. Oh, you guys didn't burn through all your grenades and ammo? Oh. Starting with the feet, we see that this is almost a perfect blending of human and reptilian DNA. Reptiles are large tetrapods, usually with four feet. This creature in particular is bipedal like humans. However, the structuring of the foot and leg overall would indicate that mammalian traits are taking hold as opposed to purely reptilian, despite how it may appear. The feet are tipped with claws several inches in length and are numbered in three, at least concerning the actual toes. A largely mammalian trait exists further up the foot, which is known as a dew claw. Think of it as like an almost thumb-like appendage, but is largely useless on other mammals, but has actually moved down to be like a thumb on the feet of apes. The actual structuring of the leg itself is known as digitigrade, as it walks on the balls of its feet. The legs overall are covered with an incredibly thick and durable armor. Whereas the hunter gammas were extremely weak to fire, possibly owing that trait to their amphibian lineage, this armor, plating hailing from the reptilian lineage, is made of a thick keratinous material, and as a result, this makes them more resistant to handheld fire or concussive force. Although, it is important to point out that a grenade directly under them or next to them will disrupt enough internal systems, armor or not, to end the creature. The legs of this creature and their connection points are obviously on the outside of the pelvis. Due to this, it is more closely resembling that of a reptile. Humans have our femurs connect to the sides of our pelvis, but rather than our legs splaying outwards, they do go straight down, and even that connection point, while it is technically to the side, it is more underneath us. On this creature, just like its reptilian ancestors, they are more outwards, say like that of an alligator or crocodile. Moving up to the abdomen, we can see that the armor plating continues and a tail will run relatively far behind it. This tail can act as a counterbalance as this creature runs, which allows it to outmaneuver prey. Moving further up to the chest, we can see that this creature possesses a large piece of armor plating that runs across its pectoral area. Now this armor plating is natural, it's not placed there, but it does appear that underneath softer tissue exists, perhaps completely exposed to the outside, or at least somewhat, making the plate quite necessary. Moving up to the shoulders, we can see that this thing is more heavily armored than usual. Flanking each side of the head, a thick callus material not only covers the anterior, lateral, and posterior deltoids, like into shoulder padding in the real football, known as American football, but it also continues up to the neck. This armor plating stops but overlaps slightly to the biceps and triceps. Now reptiles would obviously have these muscular groups because we all kind of evolved from the same thing. However, they may not be as visible, so this looks fairly human. There are pretty large differences amongst the arms, but on the right arm, it is clear to see this creature isn't right-handed. Forearm is longer, harkening back to its human DNA, with a patch of armor covering the forearm until about midway down. The hands are interesting to say the least. Specifically on the right hand, this creature appears to have more influence from its reptilian lineage, possessing only three fingers and one thumb, much like on its feet. Each finger is tipped with a large claw used for presumably more off-handed slashing. The reason I say off-handed slashing is because getting over to the other arm, we see where the real moneymaker is. The reason the arm is different is because Umbrella Europe tried to overcome the issues of weakness by altering the arm of this creature more heavily. The forearm of this creature is much larger and more heavily plated. Coupled with the fact that the arm is larger, this means that it needs to be more capable, which means it has more muscle added to compensate, or likely it's not more muscle strands, but just larger muscle strands. But the hands of this creature is the real reason this arm is larger and seems to be more human than reptilian. It seems that more direct intervention in specifically this area was preferred by scientists. Possessing four fingers and one thumb, the hand looks a lot more human and is larger than the other. The claws are also much longer than anywhere else in the body, likely to be about 8 to 12 inches long or about 0.3 meters. This hand, along with the claws as a result, are much more heavily favored in attacks, but we will get to that later. Moving up to the head of this creature, it is truly something only a mother or scientist could love. Okay, who am I kidding? Handsome boy confirmed. I mean, just look at that smile. There are mandible-like coverings over the more internal structures of the mouth. These are interesting as they actually appear to be more insectoid than reptilian, and odds are, considering what we've actually already seen in Raccoon City with insects, I would probably go out on a limb here and say this would maybe suggest that there was other DNA used on this creature rather than just reptilian and human DNA. Past the mandibles, jagged razor teeth line the gums almost to the point of being overcrowded, which may indicate that the alligator or crocodile DNA is heavily favored here. The skull is lined with the same armor plating and skin found all over the body, and the eyes appear to be small green orbs like their predator ancestors. Whether that may be reptilian or human doesn't really matter, they are forward-facing. Internally, the structure is likely a cobbled mess of functional nonsense. Under the armor plating, it's quite evident that their musculature is more than that of a human or reptile alone, which considering when something like this is made, odds are double muscle mass is added because of the two different sets of DNA, which they are both coding for their own muscle growth. Even with 
the muscle growth though, they as mentioned previously, were not as strong as the alphas. The reason for their strength is something known as muscle control. Crazy name, right? Hang in there with me. So have you ever wondered why it is that chimps are incredibly strong and can literally rip off limbs of humans, despite us seemingly having similar muscle mass? Well, it comes down to fine motor control. The original alphas would essentially send a bulk shock to their muscles, which in turn would activate more muscle tissue for each movement. This made them incredibly powerful, but it would ultimately have other detrimental effects. I mentioned earlier about the reflex arc in animals. Don't worry, we will get back to the fine muscle control motor movement stuff in a minute, but with poor coordination and contraction of smaller muscle groups, this nervous tissue issue would likely affect the reflex arc. So what is the reflex arc? When you touch something hot on a stove, essentially a signal is sent to your sensory nervous tissue and then to your spine per usual, except it's more like a screen. Rather than pass along the signal to your brain while you're sitting there burning yourself, your spine takes over and forces you to pull your hand away quickly to minimize the damage. The reflex arc shows that the spinal cord is really just a piece of our brain rather than just a bridge and is absolutely necessary because for a nerve signal to get to your brain, your brain to interpret it, and then it send back the signal to, hey, move your hand, by then you could actually lose your hand. The hunter alphas appear to have a massive issue with this nervous tissue resulting in this strength scene, but also the lack of the reflex arc making them slower to react to damage their body was incurring. To overcome this, Umbrella fixed the nervous tissue problems and as a result, it would appear that the hunter betas were able to mobilize more finely tuned muscle control. And this is where the comparison with humans and chimps comes into play concerning the human aspect. With us, we are perceived weaker because we activate less muscle tissue groups, which means we are able to do more finely tuned tasks such as writing or petting a cat. But another aspect is, have you ever seen a dog try to pet a cat? I know it's kind of obscure, but it's not very comfortable for either animal involved. And that's because they cannot activate the finely tuned muscle groups like humans can. Now we can by all means grow muscle and mobilize larger areas of muscle strands for more strength needs, but that's just a quick comparison between the strength of a hunter alpha and beta in more of layman's terms that everybody knows. It's really all about mobilization of muscle tissue. So we also see with the hunter betas, at least the original hunter betas in RE3, because uh, it's lacking in the RE3 remake, that they are covered with more tumorous material. In an effort to overcome this weakness, they were more heavily altered and as a result, it appears to have left a lot of tissue growing out of control. In the remake, the tumors appear to be absent, but one wouldn't be wrong for assuming that they do exist under the armor, and this is because of what we see with their larger arms. Or specifically one arm in particular, which I would be inclined to call this thing, it's probably entering its teenage years. The larger arm is clearly different from the rest, and would likely keep growing as the creature lived and ate over time in Raccoon City, if it wasn't just nuked into oblivion. Tumorous growth would continue to spread across the body if it hasn't already, but what I find strange is this would likely undo what Umbrella Europe was going for, as this creature would become less reactive with neural tissue degradation over time. But that's just a hypothesis, however. It could be totally inert after it reaches adulthood, and what we are seeing is completely the end product, but based on the original game and what we see with this creature, I doubt that would be the case. As mentioned in the lore, these creatures are only about a year old at this point, meaning that they are still likely growing, and growth, or at least further growth, can be experienced in the future. With all these mutations and encodings, this creature is able to move at high speeds and possess the agility to navigate these speeds. This would also indicate that its perception may be well above that of humans, as it is able to quickly move out of the way of a shot, but only a limited amount of times. However, should it get in close, or you really just suck at aiming like I do, how does this creature like to take you out? Well, its preferred method is just straight up decapitation. It is mentioned in the lore that Carlos saw these things actively decapitating the infected around it, utilizing the giant claws. For regular humans, it likes to get in close and then use the steak knives on its hands to quickly slice open your neck. Now, if you know anything about the neck, it's incredibly vulnerable. Spinal cord, jugular, carotid artery, a lot of blood needing to go through a small area. This will quickly slice these veins and artery at minimum and likely the trachea of this person, leading to them blacking out in seconds due to blood loss and suffocation, and this wound would not be able to be patched with any success. Overall, these creatures, if unleashed on the hordes of infected, would likely fare pretty well, as they already possess the T-virus themselves. They cannot get reinfected. They can move limitedly, more quickly than a human can perceive. Their armor protects them from projectiles, with only really a grenade being the most effective means at incapacitating them, and even then, it really needs to be close. And with their teeth and claws being absolutely lethal in combat, it's clear why these things were heavily considered for mass production, pending the Raccoon City combat report.